In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear sisters, dear faithful, in A.D. 257, the Roman Empire was in a state of uneasiness. Several of her enemies were encroaching upon her borders, namely the Franks, the Persians, and various Germanic tribes. In Africa, there was rebellion. The Persians penetrated in the east and reached as far as Antioch. Public opinion became, therefore, restless. And so the emperor's advisors began to whisper into his ear, They advised him to assign the blame for all Rome's troubles to some scapegoat. The emperor was Valerian, and up until this time, he had been extremely tolerant of Christianity. But the tides were about to turn. One of his advisors was Macrian, who was the imperial finance minister. And it was Macrian who advised Valerian that the church was very wealthy and that the confiscation of her property and her treasures and her revenue would be expedient. Such confiscations would ease Rome's financial crisis. All of this gave rise, therefore, to a new persecution of the church, one which arose very quickly, simply out of superstitious fear and financial greed. And so, Whereas Valerian had tolerated Christianity for several years, he nevertheless improvised and contradicted himself quite readily. He renewed quite suddenly the great persecution of his predecessor, Decius. The first edict of this new persecution was that all Christians, notably the bishops, were to sacrifice to the imperial gods. It forbade Christian worship in public, as well as visits to the Christian cemeteries. And the penalty at first was purely political. It was exile. And thus it was that St. Cyprian of Africa and St. Denis of Alexandria were both exiled at this time. But these measures proved ineffective because aristocrats and wealthy persons gave to the church their powerful protection. They opened their own private cemeteries to replace those which had been taken over by the authorities. And so Christianity continued. And so a second and more severe edict was issued in 258. Bishops and priests who refused to sacrifice to the imperial gods were to be executed. People of high rank who were convicted of being Christians were to lose their dignity. If they persisted in practicing the faith, they were to be put to death. In addition, their properties were to be confiscated Regardless, any Christians in the household of the emperor were to undergo not only confiscation of their assets, 
But they were to be reduced to the lowest ranks of the slaves. They were to be put in chains and forced to do labor. All this happened virtually overnight. It happened very, very quickly. Avarice, of course, fueled this persecution beyond belief. Many senior officials were motivated chiefly by self-aggrandizement. They saw quite readily the tremendous profits to be gained. These were the circumstances under which the beautiful and courageous and powerful story of St. Lawrence the Martyr unfolded. The newly invigorated persecution was raging, and there was panic among the Christian community. The most important victim of this newly animated persecution was none other than the Roman pontiff, St. Sixtus II. He was apprehended and dragged from the cemetery of St. Callistus during the celebration of Holy Mass. And as he was being borne off to his martyrdom, He met the deacon, St. Lawrence, on his way. St. Lawrence, of course, was the archdeacon of Rome. And so the two exchanged words as they met along the way. St. Lawrence envied in a holy way that the Pope was about to undergo martyrdom. But the Pope assured him that he himself would follow three days later. No sooner had he uttered this prophecy than a soldier cut off his head right before St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence is known very well for his good sense of humor. Despite the trying situations, which were afflicting him. And two stories stand out in this regard. After conversing with Pope St. Sixtus II, St. Lawrence was apprehended and brought before the authorities for questioning. But at the outset, he was not threatened with execution. The Romans knew very well the position of authority that he occupied. He was the archdeacon of Rome, and therefore he was responsible for all of the treasures and the revenue of the church. He was asked, therefore, only to surrender the treasures of the church. The Romans evidently had heard of the beautiful liturgical items which were used during the celebration of Mass. Reports of gold and silver chalices, gold candelabra, had reached them. And these reports are proof that the Church from her earliest days has always striven to give the very best to God in the course of her liturgical worship. When questioned, St. Lawrence admitted that the wealth of the church exceeded that of the empire. But he, of course, was referring to the wealth of God's graces and blessings. St. Lawrence was being very clever and humorous at the same time. 
St. Lawrence readily agreed to bring in the precious vases and the gold of the church. But what he had in mind was completely different from what the Roman authorities had hoped for. St. Lawrence asked for three days in order to place things in order, and the Romans readily agreed, thinking that they had succeeded in seizing the wealth of the church. St. Lawrence then set out to liquidate the entire treasury of the church. All of the church's money he distributed among the poor and the sick of Rome. Unless they be confiscated by the Roman authorities, the liturgical vessels were liquidated and the proceeds were given to the sick and to the poor of Rome. St. Lawrence then gathered together the Christian sick of Rome, the lepers, the blind, the lame, the paralytics, and he presented them to the authorities as the treasures of God's church together with the virgins and the widows as the jewels. St. Lawrence then bid the authorities to put these treasures of the church to good use for the benefit of Rome. Of course, what he was driving at was this, that the authorities of Rome should take these poor people in such need of compassion and of charity and use them as an occasion for the giving of alms. Use them as an occasion to relieve their sufferings in a charitable way. The authorities, of course, were incensed they viewed St. Lawrence's story and his actions as a mockery of their authority. And they sent him straight away to his execution. But they knew that he desired his own martyrdom. And so they resolved to put him to death as slowly as possible to make him suffer as much as he possibly could. And so St. Lawrence was roasted very, very slowly upon a gridiron. But even amid this torment, he found it within himself to be jovial. He told them, I'm done on this side. Turn me over. And the way in which St. Lawrence conducted himself during those last few days of his life upon this earth can teach us many, many lessons. We can, if we so choose, exercise much greater self-control through patience and with good cheer and humor, even in the midst of great trials and difficulties. That is exactly what St. Lawrence himself did. And the fathers of the church regard him as doing for Rome what St. Stephen, the first martyr, had done for Jerusalem. The way in which St. Lawrence conducted himself 
in the face of persecution, led to the downfall of paganism. It was a turning point, if you will, in the history of the Roman Empire. His fortitude was such that it emboldened the entire Christian community. And as soon as he was martyred, paganism began to wane in a way that it had never done previously before. More and more people gave up the worship of idols and converted to Christianity. He had done for Rome what Stephen had done for Jerusalem. And only a short time afterwards would come the Edict of Milan, legalizing Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. But we can learn through that example of fortitude very valuable lessons, not the least of which is that we can exercise a greater control over our own passions. We may say that we do not have the patience of a saint. We may say that our own temperament just isn't suited to that sort of heroic virtue. And that well may be true. But nevertheless, all too often we fail to realize just how much our attitude and our approach to life and to situations on a daily basis can influence our reactions and the outcome of various situations. We have a far greater power over our own selves than we realize or admit. And it lies within our own capability to exercise that power through our attitude, through our approach. If we only had a more cheerful and humorous attitude toward life, if only we could, from time to time, laugh at ourselves and perhaps laugh at some of the situations which befall us. We could react better to those situations. We could be more patient, more long-suffering, and we could keep under control those passions but all too often, we choose to do the opposite. We channel our energy into anger, into bitterness, into impatience. Whereas we should be channeling that energy into virtue and into resignation, making use of our God-given reason analyzing a situation for what it is with our intellect and determining how best to deal with the situation, how best to contain the outcome so that the outcome is beneficial and less detrimental to ourselves and to those around us. Let us learn from this prayerful and patient and cheerful attitude and approach of St. Lawrence the Martyr. Let us pray to him today 
and always and ask him to intercede for us with Almighty God and to grant us a greater share of patience and resignation throughout our lives so that we may accept the things that we cannot change and change the things that we can in the most reasonable way possible. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.